is Rosie Amory, and I'm the chairperson for the Living Well Committee. And uh, we try to have you know different topics, even a couple of them a month if we can get people to come and talk. So be sure to look in the HOA announcement and you can see what's coming up next. If you have any suggestions or ideas that something you would like to have or you know us come and have a talk about, please let me know. Also, some of the people were interested in about having defibrillators here because of what they saw happen on the football field. So in our article, we have posted all of where the defibrillators are. So in the next Pioneer Press, you'll be able to see all the different places at Rose and Ranch here where they are, so there are some defibrillators. Also, we will try in the future to have a C another CPR class here. So maybe some of you would like to attend that. But I'm going to just introduce the Stryker Corporation and then let you, if you want to do me back, <laughs> and then you can tell us a little bit about them and then you can hear the doctors. So thank you all again for coming. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Berry. Uh, I'm a striker. My partner, David, is back there. Um, so we're an uh, orthopedic company. have a full line range of orthopedic implants. Um, what our team specifically focuses on, what we talked about here today, is uh, total joint replacement type products. Um, and then some of the really exciting uh, robotic platforms that are out being utilized today by Dr. Reed right here. Um, I'll let him kind of dive in. I won't take up too much of our time because we have a full room here. Uh, but thanks for coming. So, thank you, Mark. so I'm going to do a little bit of walking around and pointing at things. I'm just going to hold this, but just remind me if you guys cannot hear me, then I'll be able to do a better job since it's not attached to me. I have to hold it up to my face. So, so thank you again for coming. Um, again, I, with the weather, I wasn't really sure, and so I'm glad that it wasn't as, as bad uh, and everybody was able to come today. And I see some familiar faces as well, folks that I had the pleasure of seeing in my office. Um, and, and so I appreciate the, the spreading of the news and the opportunity here to come and, and give a talk. We have quite a bit of uh, slides to go through. We'll be sort of brief, a lot of pictures. You know, it's not a lot of verbiage, so more pictures. And then at the end, I'd, I'd rather still bring up the questions and, and back and forth with the audience. I think that's, that's more educational sometimes. Okay, so. I have no financial uh, relationship with Striker, so this is something that I, I just truly believe in. I'm using this technology, and I'm not, I'm not really going to pay for it. I just think it's best for patients. Uh, okay, so basically, we're going to talk about hip and knee pain. You know, I'm an arthritic surgeon, so it's going to be mostly arthritis, but just understanding the pain, treatment options. Obviously, I'm a surgeon. We'll talk about surgery and recovery expectations from that. And then again, at the end, we'll open it up to questions and answers. So, just briefly about me, I'm part of the Texas Joint Institute. This is actually a uh, a fairly new venture, a bunch of the joints guys in town in the Frisco, Dallas, Plano area got together and said, well, we're all specialized in hip and knee replacements, really good at what we do. Why don't we just all get together and just make this joint institute? Um, and so that, that's what we did. We all got together and this is, like I said, in the making probably in the last year or so. Uh, background for me, I'm uh, originally from Albania. I was born and raised in a small country, East Europe, and I came over here when I was 15. Did a lot of my training in Philadelphia, high school, college, Villanova. Medical school at Jefferson Medical College, downtown Philly. Residency, I went to the University of Florida, and I, we had quite a bit of an exposure. There was a thousand of Robson Ranches over there. And so, <laughs> so I said, why, why would I go anywhere else for my, my extra training, which is called a fellowship, to do hip and knee replacements at a, a place that is just full of them. So uh, and we, we got to do all the easy stuff, the hard stuff, the infections, the reconstructions, you name it. Uh, so it was a great experience that I'm going to end up staying an additional year to do that. Uh, and then we moved here. Uh, it's my wife and I, the two boys, uh, Jack and Pierce, and we live in the Frisco area. And so it's, it's just a great, great area. It's constantly growing. I'm, I'm sure we're seeing this here as we're driving. So a lot of construction gets in as well. So, okay. So obviously, uh, this is a, an active community, right? You guys use your joints all the time to get out and about and do what you guys enjoy, which I hear pickleball is one of the most favorite uh, activities. And so, uh, and so this is important, right? You know, this is important like anything else. Your, your heart doctor tells you, well, you need to exercise, right? You need to lose weight, you need to get better. Well, you know, so he goes, this is show how, how important, how equally important the joints are too, right? 
Um, so different kinds of causes of joint pain, but again, we're going to sort of focus on osteoarthritis, or commonly known as arthritis. Of course, there's rheumatoid arthritis or other inflammatory processes, or, or trauma, right? You broke your knee a long time ago, and now you've got some hardware in your knee, and now you've got arthritis in the knee, same thing with your hip, if you broke your hip, and you fix your hip, and down the road you get arthritis. But those other two things are not as common as the middle one, which is the other break for arthritis, not for arthritis. And everybody asks me, what's the cause of that? It's genetics. So you're sort of born with the genes of, of causing arthritis. So um, it affects about 35 million U.S. adults. Uh, it's more common in the knee, so it's two to one as far as the knee and hip goes. It's more common in females than males. And so what is the knee arthritis? Well, we have here a depiction of what a knee looks like. You got the bone, and it's darker brown, and in the white, it's the cartilage. It's the ends of our bones, so they're coated in something soft. So they're not hitting each other and it's hard. And in between you have the meniscus, which are these little shock absorbing uh, structures, and you got the ligaments. And then as you start the degeneration process, all that nice smooth surface goes away, you get all this extra bone. Your body thinks something's wrong and starts fixing things, and it starts fixing things by putting more bone because it thinks something's wrong. That's why you get all this extra bone spur, right? That's where it goes from. Cartilage doesn't disappear, it just sort of turns into bone. Uh, same thing with the hip, at the end in our ball and socket joint, we have the lining of the joint, which is again cartilage, and then when the generation kicks in, again, that space narrows, it's no longer soft, now it's hard bone on bone with bone spurs and, and decreased uh, motion. So how does it present? Well, pain, right? Pain. Now, and, and some of you may, may hear me in my office, you guys come to me with stiffness, yeah, it's part of it, but pain is usually the, the biggest, biggest reason, right? and then stiff and swollen, and then down the road as the joint space narrows, then deformity kicks in, so a lot of my patients become full-legged, 85%, not knee, 15%. So most of the times the arthritis is in the inside of our knees, because when we load our joints, it's not equal, it's not 50-50, it's about 65 on the inside of our knee and 35 on the outside, that's the reason why we get a lot more arthritis on the inside of our knees. So how does it present for the hip? Again, pain. So the hips is a little different. It's not always in the groin area. It should be about 8% of the time, but sometimes it can be the back, sometimes it can be the knee. We actually published in, at the University of Florida, patients came to us with knee pain, had gone multiple operations, all this intervention in their knee, and the knee pain never went away. We got extra of their hip and it was bone on bone. We got the replacement of the hip and the knee pain went away. So it's not always in the, in the uh, groin, but it should, it's about 8% of the time. Stiffness again, right? I can't cross my legs, I can't lean forward to tie my shoes, that sort of stuff. And then leg leg discrepancy, sometimes the leg shortens on the arthritic side because of the bone and bone uh, arthritis. So how do you diagnose it? Well, luckily we don't need a lot of uh, invasive uh, procedures, right? And I know patients come to me with MRIs, right? In the early stages of arthritis, if the actually looks well, then you can go to the other stuff. But otherwise, for arthritis, for advanced arthritis, it's a very quick uh, study. It's called the X-ray. You can see here what normal joint space looks like. The space in between is made of cartilage and meniscus. And when it goes away, you can see it's sort of the bone on bone. And same thing with the hip. Again, that space should be somewhere like this versus here it's bone on bone with a big bone spur. This is what osteophytes are. So we can get the diagnosis pretty quickly with the X-rays. Well, so how do we treat it? Well, it's non-surgical, non-surgical, non-surgical. So we try with the walking aids, uh, heat and cold therapy, physical therapy is a big thing, and I'll get to it in a second. Medication, right, this is inflammation, so taking medication for, to fight inflammation is, is the main course of this, and then injections as well. So a lot of my patients tell me I tried the steroid, I tried the gel, stem cells, PRP, all sorts of things, whatever, whatever they want to try because they don't hurt you, that's, that's totally reasonable. So physical therapy, I'm just gonna one slide for this because I think it's important because a lot of people tell me, well, I'm active doc, right? I, I already work out, I, I don't need physical therapy. Well, it, it's, it's important to do physical therapy because it's not just about going to the gym or you walking five miles a day. You, you have to specifically target some muscles around you. So again, you can see here that you have lost space in the joint, it's bone on bone. These ligaments on the side are not as tight as they used to be. And so the bones in there are shifting back and forth. That's where that instability, sometimes it feels like my knee's giving out. Well, you got muscles around you, right? So this is your internal brace. You're walking already with a brace on. It's called your muscles. So if we go to physical therapy and targeting these muscles and truly strengthening these muscles, it's key to give you stability. And same thing with the hip. There are muscles around your hip. 
giving some stability and some strength to it is important. So physical therapy is the first thing that happens within my practice. Bracing, you can see here a cool case. On the insides here is bone on bone. We put a special brace, which is called an offloader. It's actually pushing your knee on the opposite way. And all of a sudden we get another x-ray and now those bones aren't touching anymore, right? So that's why bracing are, is important. Again, a specific kind of bracing is called offloader. It's another, another option that I, I uh, offer to my patients as well. well. What do you consider a joint replacement? Well, you know, these are some of the questions that you can, you know, there's a lot of forms online and, and or you ask your friends or colleagues and say, how, how did you know? Well, you know, is it affecting my sleep? Is it, is it keeping me from doing things that I want to do? Is, are, are you becoming less active? You know, are your inability of walking up and down stairs, dreading your daily activities? You know, great, you should answer those questions, but also, did this fail, right? Did your conservative management fail? Because a lot of patients can have those symptoms, but if they're doing this, and they're actually able to do most of those things, I think that's great, but you have to fail conservative management, okay? So if you fail the medication, the bracing, the physical therapy, the injection, and you're still answering yes to those questions, then I know that maybe something else can be done. All right, so just a quick video here of what a total hip replacement is. Like, what are we actually doing when we do a total hip replacement? Let's see this place. So again, it's a artificial joint inside here. Well, that, yeah, there you go. And we open up, and I'll get to how we get to the hip in a second, but we actually have to expose it. We see the R3 head here, and we remove it by cutting it. And then we prepare the socket by putting an artificial socket that grows into your bone. Then we put a plastic, this is your cartilage now, then we put a stem inside the canal of your bone, of your thigh bone, and then we put a little head on top of that. So now it's a smooth surface, and it doesn't hurt anymore, it's not bone to bone anymore, and it gives you more uh, range of motion now, okay? So again, this is the ball and socket, all the implants that we look at, and this is all breaking it down again, when it looks like from the socket. Plastic, ceramic, it actually does look pink, and it's very strong, and then your stem. And this area right here, you can start to see this little grittiness here, this is what the bone grows into. That's how it's fixed to you. It's fixed to you in this press fit way. It nudges into the bone, the bone starts growing in, and it becomes part of you. And this is what it looks like on an x-ray. That's what a regular bone would look like on an x-ray, and this is what a replaced hip looks like on the x-ray, okay? And we have, this is a little bit older uh, image. The newer implants are becoming shorter, so we stop about here now. We don't have to go as far down as these older implants. Go, so they are even, even more minimally invasive than what they used to be. Total knee replacement. So what, what are we doing? Well, I'll just sort of briefly mention, we're addressing the arthritis, we're taking away the arthritis, we're retensioning the ligaments, right? The ligaments were all over the place, and we're correcting the alignment. So that bow leg in this, we're trying to make it as straight as we can. And so the way it works is we open up the knee, and I'll get to that in a second, how we do that with our technique. And you can see the arthritic edges of the bone, at the end of the bone. And we go ahead and just cut them in such a specialized way to make these perfectly matched angles so we can put our implants at the bottom, bottom, and plastic in between. Okay, that's now your new cartilage right here. And it's smooth and it doesn't have that bone bone anymore and it's got that joint space back where it needs to be. A lot of times patients tell me, are you gonna cut me here, doctor? Are you gonna take the whole egg off? No, no. <laughs> taking care of the arthritis. We're, about, we're, we're removing about eight to nine millimeters of bone. Okay, it's very, very, very thin, okay? So again, this is what it looks like. There's two kinds of replacements. I'm sure you guys have heard about a partial replacement versus a total replacement. Partial replacement is if everything else looks good in your knee and it's just bone and bone on one side and everything, again, looks really pristine, you can just replace the inside of it. You can put a small metal and plastic right there get this ligament back where it needs to be, and that's it. Or, if you have arthritis in all different areas, or more than one area, then you're looking at a total knee replacement, which is right here. And this is what it looks like on an x-ray for a partial, right? The partial is just metal on the inside, and a total is metal all throughout the knee. Okay, those are the two differences between partial and total knee replacement. Again, the reason to get a partial is usually arthritis on only one side, total arthritis everywhere. So I, I didn't coin it, this is not copyrighted, but I just, I thought, I, I went on, online last night to see, is there a, there's actually websites that you can generate slogans. By putting something down, it will come up with something cool, and 
They have all over the place, nothing I can use. So I just put D by joint replacement experience instead. <laughs> you know, I put joint replacement and it, it came out like, joint replacement is the thing to do, joint replacement for kids. I mean, what is this? It's not working for them. Okay, so, you know, everything's patient-centered. You guys, you know, see me, I'm, I'm always there for my patients, and I'll get to that in a second. So, goals is to decrease pain. All right, so we're talking about the, the, the joint replacement experience, right? So everything's patient-centered, and the goal is to decrease pain. I just had a couple conversations here. The, the number of reason why we're doing surgery is because you're in pain, and you want to decrease pain. You want to avoid unnecessary risks of the patient because surgery has risks. So you want to somehow avoid or, or, or decrease the risk as much as you can. And cause less, less soft tissue insult, right? So this is where the muscle sparing techniques, which very few surgeons, honestly, around the country utilize. And, and then that, that goes on to the faster recovery, faster heal, right? Because that's, that's what we're healing, right? We're healing soft tissue, right? We're healing the swelling from the surgery, the bruising, the, the, the redness. It's not so much the bone. Once the bone's cut and you put that implant in, that, that's pretty much it. You're not, there's no fractures there. You're waiting for the bone to heal or anything like that. It's, it's pretty much done. It's the soft tissue you're working on that. It's really that we're talking about. And then the same day surgery, so we have gone a long way from two weeks in a hospital to rehab for everybody to five days to three days to one day to same day, right? So I have certain some patients here that were able to go home same day. So you know, how do we actually do it? Well, there's three phases before surgery, during surgery, then after surgery. So in the priority phase, you'll see me basically sit down, eye to eye, doors closed, and just talking, right? Going over the anatomy, doing what I did today, explaining to you what arthritis is, going over the imaging, going over the options, right? The non-operative options and then the operative options. Going over the expectations. So I just I just had a brief talk here. 15 to 20% of patients around the world do not like their knee replacement. It's higher for hip replacement, it's almost 98%. And they try to tease this out. There's all those papers coming out. Why don't patients love their knee replacement? And they found out that expectations was one of the big things. We just didn't meet their expectations. There's nothing wrong with the knee. The knee works fine. The knee range of motion is okay. It's just that their expectations going into surgery. So I do a lot of talking about that in the, upper, in, in, in the office. I say, look, let's talk about expectation. You know, so because I have patients that come to me with horrible arthritis on X-ray, and they tell me I don't have a lot of pain. I just have a little stiffness. Well, I say wait, right? Because now you have surgery and now you have some pain from scar tissue and now you have pain you didn't have before, you're gonna be unhappy, okay? Even though I address your arthritis and you've got a straight knee and a balanced knee, it's not good enough, they're not happy, okay? So, you know, we go over prescriptions. I make sure everybody sets up physical therapy before surgery because physical therapy after surgery is key to success. So I make sure that's all set up. And I, I'm available for my patients, right? I mean, you can call me and tell me I did a good job and you can call me and tell me I did a terrible job, right? So. Whatever you provide to patients, you should be there. It should be a 1-800 number, you hide behind a PA or someone else. You should be present for your patients. So they call me on my cell phone, they text me photos that they're not certain of, is this normal, is this not normal, and I'm there for them, right? That, that's key because it's a scary time. So, no general anesthesia. I avoid this, I would say, 99% of the time. I wish I could be in charge of this, but I'm not an anesthesiologist, so somebody else does this part. And so they avoid paralytics, they avoid general anesthesia, they avoid breathing tube, which plenty of studies have shown it's safer for you. And we do this under blocks, right? We, we put a spinal block in the back, we, numb, we do blocks around the hip, around the knee, we give you some light sedation like a colonoscopy, we've just taken a nap so you can wake up very refreshed afterwards with minimal nausea, drowsiness. And obviously we talked about the risk of heart and lungs with this type of intervention, they're very low, okay? And then I have the same surgical team, you know, same OR staff, and that's important, right? Because I do the same thing over and over again, but it's, it's not just me, it's everybody around me. So we work by clockwork, you know, from, from the reps in the room with the robot technicians and everybody else around. We, we have to sort of be in sync here because we move very fast and efficiently. So for the knee replacement, in trauma, what else do we do that's different than, than most? Well, no tourniquet. So this is a thigh thing that goes, uh, tourniquet, you should know what a tourniquet is, right? It's a depiction here. It goes up and it gets inflated, so there's no blood going through the knee. Imagine going to the doctor now and they check your blood pressure and that thing stays on for 45 minutes while you're waiting for the doctor. How would that arm feel, right? So imagine now that goes on to your leg and stays for a minimum of 45 minutes to almost an hour and a half, right? So the muscle damage, the reperfusion injury that happens when you let that down uh, causes a lot of time, uh, pain and, and, and weakness afterwards and trauma to the area. So many, many surgeries are adopted in a tourniquet rule, which is good. Smaller curve decisions, so I try to make my incision a little curved around the kneecap, not straight over the kneecap, so when you do the motion with physical therapy, it's not just tight over that area, when maybe you can kneel down the road, which is also another question that people ask, can I kneel onto my knee replacements? 
which you can, but sometimes it just feels a little awkward because you have a replacement underneath it. And so I do this under a curve decision. So this is a patient of mine. You can sort of see it around the kneecap, leave this area free uh, versus what a you know, regular, I just Google what a knee replacement, regular knee replacement looks like and you see some really scary uh, uh, incisions on the elbow line. Everything's underneath, no, no staples, no sutures, everything's glued and uh, dissolves underneath, okay? So for the, one, the knee replacement part, the muscle sparing I think is key for me. You know, that, not a lot of surgeons do this. Seven out of my eight mentors in Florida didn't do this. Only one did and he told me that. I think it's, 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 it's great. So traditional, well, you have here the quad muscle, that's the muscle in front of your knee, and you have the bone here, and the black line represents where we're cutting. So we're going right along here, so we're splitting this muscle away, which is part of the quadricep muscle. So we're splitting the muscle apart, cutting it off the bone, and we're continuing all the way down. So that's the traditional way, which is cutting the quad tendon. The muscle sparing, we go this way along the patella tendon, we're not cutting the patella tendon, we're just going alongside of it, and we start right there and we take a detour. And we go underneath this big muscle now with my hand, I free it, I free, 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 with just my hand, there's no, there's very minimal attachments there. And I bring it over, okay? So it sort of looks like this. So you can see now this muscle, this is a cadaver, so it's not a real, uh, patient. this is a huge incision just to show it. But you can see how the muscle now is completely, is still attached to your, your patella, this is your kneecap. So it's still attached to it and you're going just underneath it. You can still expose the knee, do the surgery, finish what you need to do, and bring it back over. And there's plenty of, of studies that show that you don't need to heal the tendon, better range of motion, better control, less blood loss, and stronger muscle contraction. There's plenty of meta-analysis. These are the biggest studies you can get, which is, it looks at all the studies in the literature and see how this patient did compared to traditional versus muscle spear, and they all show these things. They had muscle, stronger muscles, less blood loss, better pain control, better early range of motion, no heal to, no deep to, to heal the tendon, and, and so that's the benefit of the muscle sparing which I perform. So, uh, let's talk about, you know, we sort of spent quite a bit of time in, in, the, in the knee side, but same, same principles, right? How can we do the hip replacement without cutting your muscles? Well, you know, the older way of doing the replacement was what's called a posterior approach. There's an incision on the side of the hip, and we go to the back side of it. So you can see the gluteus muscles here, and you split this with your hand, you kind of open it up to look at the muscles underneath it, which is here. And then you're cutting right along here, right? You're removing all these muscles from there, all the way down here, and reflecting the back side of your joint. You do a replacement, you repair those back to bone. And people have these precautions, right? You can't lean over, you can cross your legs, you know, risk of dislocation, a hip popping out. And going to the front now, you can see this is the front side of the patient, and we're just moving muscles apart, and we're still getting to the same joint, we're still getting to the same surgery. And we get to do this under such a better approach. Like this is my patient, you know, seven centimeters, about two and a half, three inches. Another one, two and a half inches right here. You can see it right through the front. It goes right, right along here, okay? Most of the time, most underwear covers that. It's not even visible when you go to the beach. And then you can see what a lateral incision would look like. Just a big whack on the side of, of a patient's leg, okay? So anterior approaches, DA, that's, that's sort of, which more surgeons are doing these days, uh, which is great. Uh, and again, you're lying flat on your back, you're not going on the sides, you know, very low dislocation risks, you know, easy recovery, patients do much better with your active tier approach. Postoperative we'll phase, physical therapy, that's set up for surgery, continues afterwards, excellent pain control, we're not just giving you narcotics, we're giving you multiple medications that hit pain in different ways, and all together uh, work. Everything's done pre-op, you don't have to worry about it, and again, you'll have my cell phone number to reach out to me, which is a huge resource for my patients. So let's talk about the robotic technology, which is part of what I, what I do for my, uh, my replacement. So this is what a Mako robot is. It's again associated with a striker. And so this is obviously it has multiple platforms. It's got a total knee platform, partial and total hip platform. This is, in my opinion, I've used other robots in, in the market. This is the best one. Again, I, I'm, not, I'm not getting paid for, for saying all these nice things. Uh, it's, it's truly is like robotic technology. Like if you want to use robotic, use robotic technology, which is the other ones that are just giving you information about the hip and knee, but they're not actually, they're not precise like the robot. They're still allowing the surgeon doing most of the surgery. And I am doing the surgery, but I can control it in such a precise way. And the blade comes in in such a great way that it's precise every time. So it's, it's growing. It's, it's, it's going to be the, the dominant robot in the market, but it's growing all around the world and the country. And, and sort of this is how it works, right? So you'll see my patient, they'll have to go get a CT scan, which sort of maps out their knee, and, I, and that plan gets uploaded to the robot, and the robot starts 
um, plane. It comes with a CT scan and it's a knee joint. A CT scan is a series of x-rays taken at different angles that can help surgeons see things that they can't typically see with an x-ray alone. The CT scan data is used to generate a 3D virtual model of the patient's unique anatomy. This virtual model is loaded into the MACO system software and is used to create the personalized preoperative plan. Prior so it gives us all this information, right? So it tells you, you know, how, how bone length the patient is. Uh, it tells us how tight the patient is on one side of the knee to the other side of the knee, how tight are the ligaments, how much bone are we, we're going to be cutting, in, in what kind of sort of angles, this way, that way, all three-dimensional angles of the knee, the slope of the, of the tibias. And we have these, these really cool tools here where we can literally just dial all these arrows back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, so we can get those ligaments perfect. That's, that's what's really nice. Versus with traditional way, you're cutting everybody as they come in five degrees, two millimeters here, and three degrees here. That, that's what this way was, right? That's what it was in training for me. That's what it was in practice for me earlier on. You're just cutting everybody the same way, and then you're just managing what you've done afterwards. And so when you cut all your bones and you still were not happy with it, then you're cutting some more, and you're messing with the ligaments, and you're freeing over here, and you're doing over there. So it, you're chasing your tail, right? Versus now, you can do it, you can do it right, you can do it once, right? And precise. Surgery. The surgeon reviews the plan size and placement of the implant, and if necessary, modifies the preoperative plan in order to better position the implant to the patient's unique anatomy. During the surgery, the surgeon locates points on the knee in order to register. So we're marking the knee in the operating room to match the plan so we can sort of communicate with the robot and the robot now knows where we are in space. So if I move the knee around, the blade moves with me. This step helps ensure the procedure is executed to plan. Once the anatomy is registered to the 3D model, these are those ligaments we talked about. We check the ligaments, we make adjustments because we want to get these numbers as close as possible within a millimeter to each other. Then, the surgeon guides the robotic arm to remove the arthritic bone and cartilage from the knee. A virtual boundary provides tactile. This essentially has taken away all those horrific uh, complications you can hear about sometimes where the patient cut my ligament, or the surgeon cut my ligament, the surgeon cut my artery in the back and now I have an amputation. All those things have gone away now, right? So this robot will map where your bone is and that blade will stop. So if I'm going too far back, blade stops. You, as a doctor, you're too far. To the side of the ligaments, doctor, you're too far. It stops, right? And sometimes it's annoying because I'm like, ah, come on, give me your hand. Right? So it's, it's really, really cool, right? It's, it's precise. How resistance to prevent the surgeon from removing more than just the artery bone identifying the preoperative point. So you're still holding it, you're still controlling it, you're still in charge, but it's nice because it's locked into such a perfect plane and you don't have to mess with it anymore. Stay on the preoperative surgical plan. With the diseased bone gone, a knee implant is inserted into the joint space. And once the surgeon is comfortable with the knee's movement, it's off to the recovery room to begin the journey towards strengthening the knee joint. Very cool. And you can do the same technology again with partials and then hip replacement. I just had this total knee to show you. So again, personalized plan here, and we're executing there very safe and precise. Recovery, well you have surgery, obviously post-operative, physical therapy, physical therapy, physical therapy. I see you at two weeks, six weeks, three months, one year, and then every couple of years after that, or as needed. Um, obviously, majority same day or one night discharge in the hospital. Uh, by three to six weeks, right, if you want to know how fast can I go back to my activities, I'll say three to six weeks for most of the, of the activities you go back if you're trying to do a lot of pivoting, maybe six to eight weeks for tennis, but it's about that six, four to six week. And I tell you, this is a project, right? You can't just do this casually and go back to work. And you've got to focus on your knee replacement you gotta, and, and, and hip replacement too, but hip replacement recovered very, very fast. So, you know, all this stuff is fair game, walking, driving, biking, swimming, golfing, dancing, going to the beach, all that, right? If you want to know what kind of skiing, running, contact sport, basketball, jumping, you know, the old school teaching was that you shouldn't be doing some, some of these high impact activities because the plastic wears out sooner, but the plastic is getting really strong these days that people are doing all that. Now they're running, and there's, there's all, tons of news about people running marathons over um, their knee replacements or hip replacement, doing contact sport, those sort of things. So in theory, people can go back to most of their activities just fine. So just some of my patients here, and we'll see that. So I have a four hour after he's in the drive, you can still see the, um, uh, the uh, co-band here where the IV was and the hospital stuff. 
It doesn't have to like click it, I think, here. Um, yeah, and then 24 hours later, he's, he's like, he sent me this video, he's like, look what I'm doing. I told him you're cheating because that's a walker on wheels. So, so it's not really that impressive, but um, yeah, so that's, so it, it's impressive because obviously, you know, Fit 61 years old, and so he was fit before, and so they're, they're much quicker to get back to it. Um, let's see here, four hours, they're kind of walking around in their hospital room, you know, just no walker, no cane, just being able to move, and you know, anesthesia obviously is great, the blocks are very great here. I had a, this is from Georgetown, there's a, a similar um, place like Robson Ranch called Sun City, yeah. so this patient, they, they come from there, from <laughs> He's less than 24 hours. And so, um, you know, it's five days here. This gentleman sent me this video. Uh, so five days, seven days, you know, so they seem to be doing well. And at two weeks is when I see them, right? Those are the videos that they sent me. But at two weeks is when I see them. And, you know, the majority of them, I'll say 85, 90% of the time, they're... Yeah, no walker, no cane day two, she said, yeah. So, um, you know, what about bilateral? I do very little bilateral, meaning both knees at the same time. I, I'm very selective who I pick. These, both these patients um, are in their 50s and very active, and so I try to avoid that because studies have shown high risk of infection, complications, stiffness, pain, but, you know, they, a lot of times the patient twists my arm and they want to have it and they, they're doing very well in two weeks. She was playing tennis in three months, totally beating everyone. And, um, and these are my hip replacements. Hip replacements do very well, right? And so um, there's, I don't want to say much, but there's not a lot of uniqueness there, right? A lot of the hip replacements, since they're done anteriorly, a lot of people go back very quickly. So. Um, not very unique here, but I think the knees comparing to my mentors, compared to my own patients before and after I, I started this new technique, I think that's, that's a huge. Uh... So the best advice I can give you, right? And, you know, I, this gentleman approached, or other people come to me for second opinions on your replacement. Well, the best chance of having your ear replacement is having it done the first time around, right? So because revisions, which is what I do, success rate comes down, 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 right? The risk of infection goes high, the risk of stiffness goes high with revision. So. The first time around is, is the best time to do it and get it right. So do your research, ask your surgeon about credentials. Are they just general? Are they doing a two knees a month because they do shoulders and foot, ankle, and back? Or they're just specialized into one thing? I think that's really where you want to go. Because also the thing is, there are complications. Well, can your surgeon fix your complications, right? I mean, if you did a surgery and you know how to fix it, maybe you should have done surgery. So that's that's my sort of my motto. So just ask those questions, do your research, but the best time to do it is the first time around. So I'll leave this up here while I take some questions. And, and the same material information is in the back as well, including pamphlets, my credit, my uh, credit card. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everybody, it's in the uh, My uh, business card, which has my stuff on it. Yeah, so I'm with the... Uh, I'm with, I'm with ACA, so insurance is not an issue. Um, anywhere from Medicaid, Molina, Medicare, private insurance, uh, VA, um, right insurance Friday, any, any, any of those replacement plans, you know, we don't have any issues, you can take it all. Where do you operate? So I'm, I'm in Frisco, so Frisco Medical, uh, Medical City Frisco is my location, which is right on Tallway in Maine. Uh, where the Dallas uh, MLS team plays right across the street from there. So it's an easy access, I would say, and, and it's a brand, not a brand new hospital, it's a refurbished from a previous hospital, but it's private rooms, spacious, family can spend the night. Does this uh, type of surgery allow you to have it at a later age? Yeah, so 91 is my latest, my oldest patients I've had, and for a knee replacement, 97 for a hip replacement. So patients are independent, they're living later, they're living you know, independently, and they're driving, they're going places, and they don't want to live in pain. And so, you know, obviously the recovery gets a little harder as you get a little older. I know that's another question I get is, I don't want to have the surgery when I'm 10 years older. You know, I want to do it now when it's a little easier for me to take care of myself. And so that's reasonable. But in theory, it's just, I do have patients in the 80s come to me and, and book surgery. 
in the pre-op when you do all the testing and stuff for measuring the knee, the, the actual replacement that goes in, do they vary? Size. Yeah, the, the implants vary in size, and we ha we are, we already know what's what's going to be because the CT scan has already measured you, and so we already know. Well, we have everything in the room, all the sizes, and so we we pick the size that you have measured to, and we choose that size that's fit to you. And we can we can sort of adjust it. So say you're bigger this way, but you're narrow this way. We got implants to be able to fit you, and so we can adjust those numbers. And because we have the robot, so we can cut you in some different ways to now make room for the different number, right? So that matches you perfectly. Because I had a left knee replacement, and this one absolutely seems larger than the original knee. Yeah, so that's that's a fair that's a fair question. My knee always looks bigger. It's balloon. Is, be, is it because my implant is sticking out? No, it's not really sticking out. It should stick out if it's done properly. You should still have bone around your implant. And so it's because scar tissue sets in. It's very thick scar tissue, and that gives this balloon feeling of the knee. So again, when people come to me and ask me, will you take away my stiffness? Will you take away my swollen knee? I'll try, but I'll take away your pain. Right, I, I still bring it back to the pain, right? We've got to focus on the pain, right? We talk about realistic expectations, so. Okay, I'm sorry, I'll, make, I'll take it next. Okay, arthritis, does it come back later? No, so arthritis doesn't come back later because we're taking away the bone, right? So now you have artificial implants there, so there's not gonna grow, so that's that's not there. But you can have arthritis elsewhere in your body, but not in the knee or the hip we replace, <coughs> that's, that's gone. But if you have a partial, you now can develop arthritis in the other areas, right? So if you have a partial replacement, now you can have so the number one reason to convert a partial to a total is because now you have arthritis elsewhere. Hmm. You replace the whole thing? Yeah, and then you take out the partial and you put a total. Yeah. If you had a single DVT episode in your leg, what precautions should one take Preoperative? Would it be like an Eliquis uh, regimen or something to that effect? Are, are, are you currently on blood thinners? Or yeah. you finished the treatment, now you're back to risk? So what I do for those high risk patients, number one, I don't use a tourniquet, so I think that lowers your risk, right? You didn't have this tourniquet on to basically coagulate your blood for an hour or so. I usually use blood thinners. You can either do the Eliquis like we talked about. I think it's a little strong. What I do is uh, I do Lovenox, 40 micrograms. It's just a, a shot in the belly every day. I can't give you full dose, right, if you don't have a DVT again. I mean, we can, so we're not going to treat you with a full dose that puts you at risk for bleeding, hematoma, and complications. So we're going to give you a prophylactic dose, which is the rest of my patients get aspirin. They just take a baby aspirin twice a day. But if you had a history of it, we up the ante and go to the low daily for four weeks. Um, if, you're, if you're trying to do the uh, pro protocol to try to avoid surgery, how long should you allow for, say, physical therapy and things like that? Yeah, the insurance is like to see six months. You know, I think it's reasonable, six months or so. I have folks a little less than that. But most folks that come to me, have, arthritis doesn't happen overnight. They've dealt with it for years. And so in theory, they've been trying for years to, to manage their pain. But, you know, we sort of document, we put that special verbiage in our uh, paperwork so then, you know, insurance doesn't have an issue pushing it through, which is, hey, we'll try six months of conservative management. Yep. Instead of Tylenol and Motrin, is there any supplements that you recommend? Yeah, so supplements, they're all non-FDA approved. Uh, I'm okay with that. I think risk is pretty low with those things. So I say try it. I mean, a glucosamine is a lot. My patients have, uh, have that or they have a lot of anti-inflammatory in their diet, a lot of spices that they try. And if it helps you, it helps you. I have, I have no trouble with it. Um, but I don't recommend, I don't, I don't support a particular one. I just know what my patients are on. and. Some swore by them, and I say continue. And some, they say didn't help, and I said, a lot of it is just, I think it's placebo. You're not building that cartilage again. You know, I mean, you're, you're not. That's genetic, it's gone. Uh, even the gel injections, which came out to be, oh, well look, we're injecting something that's in your cartilage, hyaluronic acid. Uh, is this building your cartilage? The answer is no. It's just a, a goo that we found, we found out with pharma that it doesn't reject, it's not rejected by your body. So we made this great thing called the gel injection, but it, it doesn't do anything. But I still try it. I said, you try everything you can. You showed an awful of knee breaks. And is that something you have to be fitted for? Yep. Yeah, you get fitted for, you get adjusted, you get taught how to use it and how to sort of adjust the angles and the pressure, how to check your skin so it's not pushing on your skin and causing, you know, bruising or ulcers or something. Yeah, a phys a, yeah. I'm not a physical therapist, but a, an orthotist, you know, DJ or Bragg, whatever your surgeon uses, will pitch you for that. Or they have staff in their room, in their office. Okay. 
Do you wear that offloading all the time, or when just you're, when you're exercising? When you're exercising, because that's where your pain is, is when you're when you're loading it. So meaning right. when you're doing exercises or you're, yeah, you know, you're walking long distance, that sort of thing. Are I'm not going that side. I'm sorry. Are you doing ACL meniscus repair with this technology? No. You, so the meniscus are removed when you remove the bones. The menisci are removed. So is your ACL and PCL. You don't need them anymore because you have now this plastic in there that does the function of the meniscus okay. and the ACL. Yeah, but if you didn't need the. Are you talking about the partial? Yeah. Just yeah. So for the partial, we're just taking the meniscus on the side that's affected. We're leaving all the ligament. This is the reason why partials feel natural. People recover sooner. It's a sort of a nice feeling means because you're still keeping your ligaments everywhere else. We're just taking that meniscus and the arthritis on that side. Yeah, we'll go from the back and we'll go to the front. Yeah, you're your friend. Oh, uh, to some people's body rejects, does it reject the plastic that you're using? Will they have problems down the line? Okay, so the plastic is not rejected. Uh, I think you're you're opening up a, a can of worms because I, I usually kind of dread a little bit when patients tell me, am I going to be allergic to my metal doctor? <laughs> and so I said, oh gosh, where did you read this? Um, so <laughs> there are patients that say I have metal allergies, which is, which is reasonable and true, right? They go to the allergies and everything. And so if you come back, if you come to me with that information, say I'm allergic to nickel because the top part of the bone or the top part of the metal is made of cobalt chrome, which has nickel inside. Then I say, okay, we can use that, right? We have to use an implant that's just made out of titanium. Titanium doesn't have nickel in it. But if you, you know, there's plenty of studies, including the Mayo Clinic, that came out and looked at people with documented allergies and had these things in and had no issues. So they disproved it. But if you already come to me with that and you somehow fall in that 20% of patients who don't like their knee replacements, you're gonna blame it on something. And so I take it out of the equation completely and I say, okay, let's put you into titanium knee so you can never blame it on that. The plastic, not so much, that's fully uh, tolerated. It's the metal, the top metal, the cobalt chrome metal. Yep? Hip I'm sorry. Hip bursitis, is that a beginning to hip bursitis? Yeah, hip bursitis, it can be part of a, a issue with arthritis, but oftentimes it's a completely separate issue. So I see hip pain all the time, and not everybody has arthritis. So they have SI joint pain, they have pain back here, they think it's their sciatica, it's just right behind their buttock. It's the sacroiliac joint. They have pain on the side of the hip, which is the bursitis, right? The, the IT band goes over that bump over the bone we have here, and we have a burst underneath there. So that's completely separate. We do physical therapy, we do injection that goes away. So a lot of times patients come to me with hip pain, I've got an x-ray, it looks fine, I press on the side, I say it's bursitis. No need for surgery for that one. Yeah, uh, did you talk about for a second uh, using pain medications to help alleviate their arthritic pain, like uh, naloxacan and Medrol. How those might compare or be effective? Yeah, so that's 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 all we, we use as a part of a conservative management. So meloxicam or Solibrex are the two big medications that we use, are prescription only. They're kind of like stronger leaves, essentially. You can buy a leaf on the counter or you can use Solibrex or meloxicam. In an acute flare, when people come to me and say, I can't walk on this knee, it hurts a lot. You know, I do the steroid injection on the inside of the knee because I don't want to give the medrol dose back, like you said, which is a five-day oral treatment. I do that for bursitis, I do that for SI joint pain, something that I can't easily target, but the knee, I can target very easily. I put a needle inside and I put steroid in that area. So there's a steroid all over your body, now all of a sudden makes you bloaty, kind of affects all the stuff in your body, uh, it affects your sugar, right, and all those stuff. That's why for those patients, I tend to lean more towards an injection than the medications by mouth. But the the injection, injection would be a cortical steroid? A cortical steroid injection, a steroid injection, correct. Yeah. yeah. Did you have the uh, SCL reconstruction before? So you got a little bolts in there, a little screws in there from cat fire surgery. Mm -hmm. Did you do the knee replacement? How did it address? Because yeah, so. So we, we talk all the time with the uh, uh, makeup specialist and we get to map out, we get this amazing view, a CT scan is so precise, it tells you exactly what the tunnels are, right? the tunnels are what they have to use to reconstruct you and how much bone void you're gonna have and where the hardware is and where our implant is sitting and if it's done in a way at all, we leave it alone, it's just part of you. If it's in a way, when we make the cuts, we can see it, we can remove it. You know, it affects maybe perhaps, and I didn't get into this very often, but there's some implants that are fixed to you with cement and there's some implants that are fixed to you in a pressed fit way, kind of like the hip technology. So if the bone uh, bone tunnels or the screw or something like that gets in the way of that, we cement it, 
if it's still very strong bone, good bone, healthy bone, then we press fit to the knee replacement. So it, it can change a little bit our plan, but we're totally prepared. We can see with a CT scan. We know exactly where to make our cuts and how to address that. And we operate all the time on ACL patients. Yeah, so that's another good question. Um, we don't live in the future, we can only see what's happened in the past, right? So in the past, the older knees are 25 to 30 years still kicking, doing well, so we can only assume it's not gonna be that, but it's gonna be more because the plastic's not even higher. But we're coming out with a 10 year data, a 15 year data, and they're, they're looking great. 95 to 98% are still alive, are still kicking. <laughs> <laughs> the implants are still alive, and so are the patients. Around. Yeah, so if we didn't get to it, because we have to clear the room or whatever, I'm, I'll stick around. Okay. Uh, or I have my email and my cell phone as well if, if something comes up later you. on. Okay.